So as we continue our discussion on gene expression, in this next flowchart, we're going to really be able to appreciate the complexity that's seen within eukaryotic gene expression and eukaryotic transcription. Let's remember that we as eukaryotes are obviously more complex than our prokaryotic counterparts. Let me prove to you the immense amount of complexity that we have as compared to our prokaryotic friends by looking at something known as post-transcriptional modifications. Post-transcriptional, this is the title of our next flow chart, modifications. These only happen in eukaryotes, so I want you to remind yourself that this is only in you, in eukaryotes. So post-transcriptional modifications are things that are going to happen after transcription on an mRNA transcript that was just transcribed. This only happens in eukaryotes. So what we have to understand um, is one term uh, before we move any further is the idea of something known as pre-mRNA. Pre-mRNA is only seen in us, in eukaryotes, and it is defined as something that is the result of transcription that must, absolutely must, be further, must be further modified to make a more usable form of mRNA. So basically, it is an immature mRNA molecule in eukaryotes. So eukaryotes undergo transcription, and let's remember where transcription occurs, because this is important. Transcription happens within the nucleus, and once that nucleus region has made a transcript, you would think, okay, time for that transcript to move out of the nucleus and go to the cytoplasm, because that's where the ribosomes are and that's where I can do translation. But that's not the case in eukaryotes. That pre-mRNA has to be further modified in the nucleus through several different modifications, okay? And we're going to see how this pre-mRNA will eventually turn all the way into a mature mRNA on this side of the flowchart. So moving forward, what we have to do is, with this pre-mRNA molecule, we have to do some alterations, some tailoring of sorts. And so we have to do some alterations specifically at ends of pre-mRNA molecule. So at the ends of pre-mRNA. So the pre-mRNA, as you know, has a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end. That's because it reads in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. The polymerase made a new transcript. That RNA polymerase made a pre-mRNA molecule that will have both a 5' prime end and also a 3' prime end. And interestingly enough, there are going to be some tailoring events, some alterations that have to occur at both of these ends of the pre-mRNA molecule, this immature mRNA. Specifically at the 5' prime end, we're going to add what is known as a 5' prime cap, and that is simply a guanine molecule that's going to be modified and attached at the 5' prime end. It's a cap. It's a structural component. And at the 3' prime end, we have to add what is known as a poly a tail. A bunch of adenines, about 250 to adenosines, a bunch of about 250 to 500 adenines are going to be added. A bunch of A's are going to be added at the three prime end um, in order to do something. So I'm wondering as a, you know, biologist, why is it necessary? Why? Why, why, why would we need to do this? Why does pre-mRNA need a 5' prime cap and a poly A tail if it seems like it's a good enough mRNA molecule that can just go out of the nucleus to a ribosome and get translated? Well, of course, it's not that simple. What we have to understand is that this pre-mRNA molecule, thus the eventual mRNA molecule, needs to um, export from nucleus. So it has to leave the nucleus. What does that mean? Well, what you have to understand is that the nucleus, imagine the nucleus, it's equal to a safe, nice home, a nice, safe environment. In the nucleus, the pre-mRNA molecule is able to float around and do whatever it needs to. But what happens is, if we go with this just pre-mRNA molecule, outside the nucleus, okay, outside the confines of this safe home, outside the nucleus, we end up with a ton of danger. There is danger outside the nucleus. 
i.e. there is danger within the cytoplasm. And this is specifically due to the presence of something known as exonucleases. So I'm going to just draw it over here. There are exonucleases that are outside of the nucleus. Exonucleases are simply molecules, enzymes, that are going to degrade mRNA. mRNA, naturally, once it's done being used within the cytoplasm, has to be removed. And exonucleases will notice when an mRNA is done being used, and it will remove the mRNA by degrading it. So what you have to do is you have to get this mRNA molecule, this pre-mRNA molecule, some protection. And in order to do that, what are you going to do? You're going to add a 5' prime cap and a poly A tail. So the whole point of this, the whole point of adding these alterations is protection. So what do you do? You protect with 5' prime cap and a poly A tail. Those two things are going to increase the stability of the mRNA molecule, increase the ability for that mRNA molecule to leave the nucleus, withstand the dangerous cytoplasmic environment full of nucleases, full of enzymes that are there to degrade anything that looks weird, and protect it. So there's a great amount of protection due to 5' prime cap and poly A tail. And also, one last thing about this in terms of why it needs to happen, um, this poly A tail and 5' prime cap also aids in recognition, and recognition specifically by uh, the ribosome. The ribosome will notice a fresh new mRNA molecule, has a 5' prime cap and a poly A tail, and will say, oh, this is something that I must translate now, because it is just fresh out of the nucleus, just fresh out of these post-transcriptional modifications, thus it's time for me to translate it. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind these alterations, the, re the reason, <coughs> excuse me, the reason for these alterations. Now, another post-transcriptional modification you need to understand is known as RNA splicing. So besides just protecting the pre-mRNA molecule by adding these two protective components, these two protective and recognition components, known as the 5' prime cap and poly A tail, you have to do some splicing. So let's reimagine something. We have to imagine that central dogma of biology one more time, in which we go from DNA to RNA, that's through TXN, of course, through transcription, but it's not RNA technically, eukaryotes at least. It's actually pre-mRNA, right? It has to turn into pre-mRNA, and then it will turn into mRNA. This pre-mRNA will have some components that need to be removed, okay? What I mean is, when we go from DNA and transcribe it to pre-mRNA, that pre-mRNA will be with W slash, with two important concepts, two important things. Things that are known as exons and also things that are known as introns. What are the exons? The exons are what we're going to be considering expressed sequences, okay? Eventually things that will be expressed. This is about gene expression. Gene expression will have exons that will be expressed. You can consider these the real 100% coding regions, okay? Coding regions of mRNA. These are the things that the ribosome will read, will code, and will turn into proteins eventually. So do you think we have to take these out or keep them? These are, of course, going to be kept. So we're going to write down keep, okay? Absolutely need to keep the exons. So in order to keep and why we're keeping them is because these will eventually be translated into proteins, okay? So they are translated to protein. So now what about these introns? What's the story with the introns? The introns are not expressed, okay? They are actually known as intervening sequences. That's why they're called introns. So they're intervening. And whenever something intervenes, it's not kind of annoying. It's not, it's getting in the way of actually what needs to be expressed. So what you do with these intervening non-coding sequences, let's say, you're going to splice them out. You're going to take them out. You're going to remove them. So we keep our exons, but we're going to, of course, remove remove, remove, remove our introns. And this is going to be because these introns will never ever be translated. Okay, they are not part of the translation process. They are non-coding regions, thus they are not translated. 
So this is our sort of modification to our central dogma of biology, that there are exons and introns within eukaryotes that undergo some post-transcriptional modifications. So that pre-mRNA molecule has exons, we keep them, we take out the introns. And that intron, those introns are specifically taken out by a process known as splicing. It's called RNA splicing for that reason. Splicing is simply defined as the process in which we remove introns from pre-mRNA, from pre-mRNA in nucleus, because remember this is occurring in the nucleus, we're all doing all these modifications in the nucleus in order to prepare it for that dangerous cytoplasmic environment in nucleus via things called spliceosomes. Okay, those are these are structures within the nucleus that have a very important function. They're called spliceosomes. So a body meaning some, some meaning body that is devoted to splicing. So what is a spliceosome? A spliceosome, more specifically, is an arrangement of several different proteins and small RNA molecules that are going to do the following processes. They're going to bind to introns. So a spliceosome will bind to the introns. They will, of course, splice away the introns, thus their name, splice away introns. And of course, splicing means to remove the same thing. That's why it's called RNA splicing, removing introns, removing those intervening, non-coding, bothering sequences, and keeping the exons, of course. So we splice away the introns. Um, we also will degrade the introns once we've spliced them, meaning that we'll just completely get rid of them in, from the entire environment because they're not necessary. So we're going to degrade the introns. And then, um, interestingly enough, I think this is really cool, we actually put the, the spliceosomes, put exons back together. Because when you have an intervening um, sequence, you're going to have to remove it. But then what you're going to have is this big gap in between an exon and another exon. And that intervening sequence is removed. So you're going to push those two exons right back onto each other, back together, so that you have a nice, concise, mature mRNA. Once this is done, you have created a mature mRNA molecule. You have gone from a pre-mRNA, a immature mRNA molecule through the alterations of 5' prime and 3' prime and poly A tail and 5' prime cap through RNA splicing in order to remove these introns via the spliceosome, you have finally made a mature mRNA. So we've t turned a pre-mRNA in eukaryotes all the way to, and we're going to conclude with this, a mature mRNA molecule. This mature mRNA molecule is smaller than the pre-mRNA molecule smaller than pre-mRNA. Why is it smaller? Well, of course it's smaller because you took out so many of those introns, those intervening sequences. Um, so it's, of course, going to be smaller. This mature mRNA molecule will then move to the cytoplasm, so it moves to cytoplasm. Of course, you have to ask yourself, why is it going there? Because it eventually has to now be, it has to reach the ribosome. So it has to get to the ribosome. Once it gets to the ribosome, we can then provide it, this mRNA provides, and here's this word again, a template for TSN. What did we say TSN was? Translation that's going to happen at the ribosome, and thus we've gone through all of these complex processes to create a perfectly nice and mature mRNA molecule through post-transcriptional, after-transcription after transcription modifications that only happen in eukaryotes, okay? Prokaryotes don't do this. They go straight up transcription, right to translation. We do all these fancy editing techniques in order to create a nice, strong, mature mRNA molecule.